The Gospel according to John. Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will make us free? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Please be seated. In the Gospel story that I just read, Jesus is talking to people who had followed him, or believed in him, or maybe possibly still do. We're not really sure where they're at in their spiritual journey. But one of the mistakes people make as they read this particular story is they think he's talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. But he's not. He's talking to the people who had already begun to follow him. These people, uh, Jesus has a few words to because there's something wrong in their view of spirituality and in their intentions. Or somehow they're following him. Something is off. And so Jesus talks to them and says to them, you know, if you actually continue to follow me, if you follow my word, then the word is going to set you free, and you will be free indeed. Right away, this creates an outrage. This is, this is, uh, it rubs everybody the wrong way. These people are upset. What do you mean we need to be set free? We're descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves. And it's a very bold proclamation. It's also very interesting considering that not far from them, because this is happening in the Temple Mount, just within, you know, about four or five hundred yards of where they're standing. There's a big uh, uh, barracks where the Roman soldiers who were occupying Jerusalem lived. And so within, eyes, within the, uh, the view of their eyesight, they can see the fact that they're indeed slaves to the Romans. But literally throughout the history of Israel, the people have often been captive by one country or another. So this bold proclamation that there's, they are descendants of Abraham and they've never been slaves, it's just simply not true. Jesus has hit a raw nerve. And we see their capacity to deceive themselves, for self-deception, uh, to, to refuse to admit the obvious truth that is around, around them, doesn't seem to have any limit at all. The Reformation, today is Reformation Sunday, and it's a day where we commemorate uh, the Reformation. Please note, we do not celebrate the Reformation uh, to celebrate because the Reformation resulted in massive church splits, massive arguments. We don't celebrate those kinds of arguments, but we do commemorate the Reformation. But as we get together today to, to commemorate this day and, and its importance, I think there's a couple things we, we could note, and maybe some historical uh, facts that might help guide us to what is the purpose of this day. You see, when Luther first hung his 95 Theses on the door in Wittenberg uh, on this day, the day that we commemorate, um, it wasn't the beginning of the Reformation. The Reformation had begun years uh, before him, and it would continue years after his death. Uh, Martin Luther was just one moment, one part of a very grand movement to want to bring change to the church. Martin Luther had no intention of creating Lutherans. He had no intention of creating a new church. He just wanted to bring change to the church. You see, he understood that every once in a while, the church needs to be redirected. The church has this tendency, because it's led by humans, too often, who don't listen to God, the church has a tendency to, to wander off, and it needs, to be a, it needs an adjustment every once in a while. And that's what Martin Luther was intending, to bring change, to reform the church, not to create a new one. And so when he nailed his 95 things that he thought were needed change in the church to the door of that uh, seminary, uh, you might have thought that created a, a big movement, that all of a sudden everything changed from that moment on. Actually, everybody ignored it. No one re there was no reaction. There was no response right away. It wasn't until those 95 pieces were printed and distributed in, in, uh, abroad everywhere that there began to be a reaction to what he said. So it wasn't like this day was like the day when everybody gathered together and decided we're going to be free and 
No, it was actually just an ordinary day where one man decided to summarize a movement that had begun years before, a movement to bring change and to adjust the attitudes and the practices in the church. And it's interesting to know that the very first thing that he said that needed change, the very first thesis, is about repentance. He said people in the church, both the leaders of the church, but also the people who were just in the pews, need to repent. And when he said about repentance, it's not just feeling sorry, not just feeling bad, not just having a desire to want to change your life. But for him, repentance was admitting deep down inside that you had deceived yourself, that you thought things were okay when things weren't. In fact, repentance at its very core was admitting your own faults, your own failures, your own sin, admitting to your own self-deception and letting all the ugliness of who you are be exposed. That's Mark Luther, where repentance was. And for him, the Reformation, this movement that began long before him and would continue long after him, this movement only began and was summarized by this need to repent. Echoing the words of Jesus when he appeared on the scene, his first public words to people were, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Martin Luther took that phrase and said that it's true today, for his day, as it was in the days of the first and early church. Self-deception. Human beings have a tendency to deceive themselves, and that has not changed from generation to generation. Today, we often deceive ourselves just like the church was doing back then. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we're okay. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we are spiritual enough. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we have things all under control, that we are actually free, and that we are making decisions totally objectively on our own, and nothing else is influencing us or captivating our minds or our hearts. We have the capacity to deceive ourselves into thinking that we don't need to be saved, that we aren't in desperate need of a change in our own lives. The church today, in fact, we today, because we are the church, are in a very similar position as to where Martin Luther stood 500 years ago, as to where the church stood 2,000 years ago, when it first began. In fact, if you want to see the world's capacity for self-deception, just look at, read the news. Every day today, we have a new story, a new person who's rejecting facts in order for it, to accept a story that makes them feel comfortable about themselves. It's frustrating when you read the news to try to figure out what is true, because everybody has their own set of facts, their own set of stories, their own set of way the world should be, the way that the world is, none of them seem to, seeming to agree to one another. Everybody just wanting to believe what they want to believe. Whoever makes them feel good or tells them the story that they want to hear. And it seems to be rampant in our society today. Materialism is a thing that enslaves all of us. We are slaves to money, and yet we don't want to believe it. We think we are in control of our money and our finances. Yet so many of us are slaves to debt or to this idea that I need one more thing. We are slaves, we are deceived by this idea that we really don't need God, that it seems to be so prevalent in our society today. Self-deception is something that our society seems probably very adept at. It seems to be something that we're very gifted at. So the Reformation began with a man, with people saying, no, 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 we can't deceive ourselves. We need to change. We need to reform. We need a little bit of course correction. And it seems to be something that we need as well today. Besides today being the Reformation Sunday, it's also, uh, we're in the middle of our stewardship campaign. And stewardship is just this idea that God has granted us our lives, our possessions, our time, our talents, all of this. And we need to be good stewards of everything that God has given us. So every year, we, we examine what it is that we need to be stewards, or how we can be better stewards of everything that God has given us. Last week, we looked at God's image, and we, we learned and understood that God has created us in God's image, and we are to be stewards of that image, that people see God when they see us. And whatever image of God we portray to the world, that's what they will see. And so we need to actually be good stewards of God's image. This week, I think we need to be think about this story of the Reformation, because we are stewards of the Reformation as well. 
We are stewards of a movement of people who wanted to bring change, to correct the ways that people were thinking, to expose the self-deception in the church and in the lives of Christians so that people could encounter God in new and life-changing ways. In a world that seems so adapt, so gifted, as I said, for self-deception, it seems to me that we should be stewards of this reformation, this story that brings truth. When Jesus spoke to those crowds, he wasn't trying to really condemn them. What he was doing was he was concerned with their ability to deceive themselves, to not understand just what kind of a predicament they were in. The hard truth was that as Jesus spoke to them, and as they continued this dialogue, if you read further, they get very angry with Jesus. And again, these aren't Pharisees, these aren't religious leaders, these are the actual followers of Jesus, the crowds that wanted to, 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 to believe in him and to worship him. When he says these things to them, they get angry. And there's a dialogue that happens, and Jesus explains further the truth is, and it, and it gets them more and more upset. And it ends with them picking up stones and trying to throw, stone and kill Jesus, his own followers. See, we like living in self-deception. We don't like it when the truth about who we are is exposed. But it seems to me that that's what the Reformation is about, more so than anything else. It's not condemning the world. It's not condemning our leadership of the church. It is simply telling the world, telling the people around us that we have a capacity to deceive ourselves. And every once in a while, we need to allow ourselves to be exposed to the truth, to allow God's Spirit to come in, to quit hiding, and to allow healing and change to become part of who we are. Our theme for our 75th anniversary and our stewardship campaign is our turn now. We want to look at the legacy that has been given to us, the legacy of the Reformation, the legacy of the first people who began our church 75 years ago, and what are some of the things, the truths, and the stories that they're handing down to us. And one of the things that is amazing to me about the generation that began this church was that they had this attitude of they weren't going to give up. They weren't going to just walk away every time something happened in the church that they didn't disagree with or they felt didn't meet their needs or made them upset. In fact, when things go wrong, what we need to do is not abandon the church, but we need to follow Luther's footsteps. And we need to say, okay, something's wrong here. We need to first allow the truth to be spoken. We need to allow our own lives to give up our self-deception, to allow our own lives to be exposed. And we need to be willing to accept change so that we more like the people that God intended us to be. I think today we give up too early. Whenever something dissatisfies us, that's it, we're gone. We don't want to stay committed. We don't want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We just want the world to cater to us. And I think that the legacy of the Reformation, maybe the legacy of our church founders here at Alpine, was that we shouldn't give up. That we need we desperately need God. And that we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that everything's fine, that we're always in control. But instead, to take this lesson of repentance, allow ourselves to be exposed so that the Holy Spirit can move and work in our lives, bring us closer and more dependent upon God. Amen? Amen. Our takeaways for today. Go to the takeaway, that's the quote. Uh, next, there. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Here we go. Previous one, sorry. There we go. Self deception is one of the biggest barriers to knowing God. We are not as free as we think. That's one of our main takeaways about what the Reformation was about. It's about exposing the deception, the self deception of individuals, uh, both the leadership, but also just regular Christians. And the second one, Reformation begins with repentance, a repentance where we confess how we deceive ourselves and allow the ugly parts of ourselves to be exposed. And reformation is what Reformation is about. It's about reforming ourselves to be the people of God. Let's stand for our song of the day.